Good morning, church. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And good to see all of you here this morning. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. We're so glad that y'all are here with us this morning. In the bulletin, we do have our connection card. It looks just like this. And if you are a visitor with us, or if you have a prayer need or a praise to share with us, uh, please fill it out on this connection card. We just love to follow up with you and get to know you. And again, we're just so glad you're here this morning. I wanted to highlight a few things in the bulletin this morning, but make sure to read over it. There's a lot of upcoming activities and ministries. Uh, tonight, uh, we will not have evening services due to Mother's Day. I hope you have some extra blessed time with your family. And tonight's deacons meeting has also been rescheduled to next Sunday. So no deacons meeting tonight, no evening services tonight. Baby bottle boomerang, who's excited? Yeah, yeah it begins today. So if you're not familiar with that, you can take a baby bottle, you fill it with change. I know my kiddos have been doing a great job. We have ours half full. They, they stole it early. That's why, okay? But it's not, you grab one, you fill it up, and you bring it back on Father's Day or by Father's Day. You can take two if you want, but that helps the care center over there in Huntsville. Um, if you have more questions about the care center, feel free to talk to me. I actually know some of the people there, and it's a wonderful ministry. We also have our Natius River Baptist Association meeting. On Tuesday, the 14th, here at the Dorcas Wills, it's going to be at 7 p.m. here in the church sanctuary, and you're invited to come and to join us, okay? Again, a joy to be here with you this morning. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord together in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. What a joy and a blessing it is to be here together in your house, Lord. I thank you for each of these here with me, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I lift up those on the live stream as well, Lord. Thank you for them and that they're able to tune in wherever they're at today. We thank you for blessing us with that technology, Father. Lord, I pray that in all we do, that it would honor and glorify your name, Father. And I thank you for the praise team, for the choir. I pray you be with them as they lead us in song and praise this morning. And Father, I thank you for Pastor Greg and for the message that you've placed upon his heart to share with us this day. Lord, may we put all distractions aside and may we focus on you and what you have for us. Lord, grow us in you. Help us again, Father, in all we do to honor and to glorify you. May we be bold in sharing the good news of your son, Jesus, to all those around us. Father, we again just love you. Bless this time that we have now together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this, we're going to have our fellowship song, so I encourage you to greet those around you and then join us in our opening song.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day that we can come and worship you and celebrate our mothers. Lord, we ask you to just bless each mother that's here and let us remember, Lord, that they, that they are so good to us. Thank you, Lord, for being our Lord and Savior and, and saving us. Be with us now as we go through this service. And, ask you to bless this offering as it used to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Are mothers. We are mothers. We are mothers. We're the ones who are stretched thin and stretched far. The ones who live on caffeine and God's grace. We're the ones whose hearts are walking around outside of our bodies. We are the women who love children that we didn't birth. The women who wait to hold the babies we couldn't carry. And the women who ache for a dream that sometimes feels unseen. We're the North Stars who guide our children home and welcome them back into the fold, no matter how far they might have gone. We are the ones who love this life. Even on the days we don't like it, motherhood is harder and holier and better than we ever thought. Some days you want to quit. Most days you can't imagine your life being anything else. But becoming a mother changes everything. And here's the truth that we all need to be reminded of today. God chose you. God chose you in this time for your children. He called you. He anointed you. He entrusted you. He trusts you. God knew exactly what he was doing when he gave you your children. He knew the long nights and the short years. He knew the long nights and the short years. He knew the pain and the incredible joy. And he knew that there was no better mom for the job than you. Today, today, we celebrate you. Today, we honor you because you carry one of the hardest and holiest callings. You are a mother. You are a mother. You are a mother. You are a mother. To our mothers, happy Mother's Day. I'm so glad you are choosing to be here this morning. I love that video, and I'll give credit to Emily for picking it out. I think it speaks so many things that are true to us. One of the things that jumps out closely to me is getting second chances from moms. But I also want to say this. There, there are some here that you may not be a birth mother, but that video is a reminder that there are lots of mothers that never gave birth. And we are called within our church family to love all the children who come our way. Some of you are loving, loving neighborhood ch children and investing in their lives in a way that a mother hasn't done for them. You have become that role. A man named Herbert Farm writes, God's masterpiece is mother. God took the fragrance of a flower, the majesty of a tree, the gentleness of morning dew, the calm of a quiet sea, the beauty of the twilight hour, the soul of a starry night, the laughter of a rippling brook, the grace of a bird in flight. Then God fashioned from these things a creation like no other, and when his masterpiece was through, he called it simply Mother. I, I, I have some more things I want to share, but the first thing I want to do, or the next thing I want to do, is to share a gift with you from the church. And this gift is for every lady who is present. I got people who are jumping at the bit. Wait one minute. We'll get them passed out. Uh, I, I really want every lady here to take a gift. And I'm going to show you what they are. Do you call these compacts? You open it up. There's a little mirror. You put it in your purse. And it says, mothers of faith are a reflection of God's love. 
And, and we want every one of you to have one of these. If, if you are not a mother, it's okay. We want to appreciate you too. And you may have a mother figure in your life that you'd like to share this with today. So our young ladies, I think it's just young ladies who are coming to help. All right. So if y'all would start, get, make sure every, y'all can, you, want me to, you hold a basket. And, and, all right, y'all going to get the choir? So Ricky, why don't you do this side? Esther, start Esther, this way. We got the choir, okay. Very good, thank you. Thank you, guys. Let's give one to every lady up here. <laughs> She's being a mother. We're going to make sure that everyone gets one, but as the girls continue to, to pass these out, I want to share some quotes with you. I, I believe these are, are powerful reminders of what mothers are and why they matter. First, first one, when your mother asks, do you want a piece of advice, that's a mere formality. It doesn't matter if you answer yes or no, you are going to get it anyway. Amen. That was from Irma Bombeck, motherhood. All love begins and ends there. Robert Browning. When you are a mother, you are never really alone in your thoughts. A mother always has to think twice, once for herself and once for her child. Sophia Loren. All that I am or ever hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Take a guess. One of our presidents. Anybody have a guess? Did anybody say Abe Lincoln? Abraham Lincoln. That was, that was from Abraham Lincoln. A mother understands what a child does not say. That is a Jewish proverb. I realize when you look at your mother, you're looking at the purest love you ever know, Mitch Alborn. Mother love is the fuel that enables a normal human being to do the impossible, Marion C. Garrity. A mother is a person who, seeing there are only four pieces of pie for five people, promptly announces, she never really did care for pie, to Neva Jordan. Mothers hold their children's hands for a short while, but their hearts forever, credited to an unknown source. And number 10, a mother's love endures through all, Washington Irving. We could probably add a few of these to, to our own comments or add to this list, but I'm grateful they do remind us why our, our mothers matter. We appreciate you, all the work you do, and I don't think I could speak it any better than our video did this morning. We are grateful. I want to, I want to finish this, this recognition with a prayer. It's a poem, and I'm going to read it to you, so I want you to bow with me and listen to the words offered as a prayer for our mothers. A mother's love knows no bound. Stronger than any force on earth it surrounds. With gentle arms and comforting embrace, she shields us from life's storms we face. Through sleepless nights and countless tears, she offers comfort, calming our fears. In her presence, we find strength anew. Guiding, nurturing, her love shines through. Oh, blessed be the mothers in our church with hearts of gold and love that never wavers. On this special day, we honor you for all the miracles you continue to do. Lord, we thank you for our mothers. And we pray this day that they will be reminded of our appreciation. They'll be reminded of the important role that they have played and will continue to play as long as you have breathed life into them. May your blessing richly rest upon them. We pray together in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
Stand with us, if you will, if you're able, as we continue to worship in song. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You're hidden. children who would like to go to children's church. Mrs. Debbie is at the back waiting for you guys. The rest of y'all keep standing because I'm going to get you while you're up to read God's word together. First Samuel chapter 1. I'm sorry to those of you who sat down, my wife, and maybe not your daughter, not my daughter. Oh, it was you. Okay. Sorry to make you up and down. Well, we're going to read two verses today from chapter 1. 
We're covering a lot more than that, but I want these to be our focus as we, we jump into our scripture. So let's read together, beginning in verse 10. When we read there, it starts with she. The she is Hannah. Hannah is who we'll be spending time talking about today. And we'll read there, she and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for your word. And we pray as we study through these first two chapters in the book of 1 Samuel that you would speak to us, that we would see in the example of Hannah ways that we should live our lives. Whether we are a mother or not, there are truths here that are meaningful to us. May your word come alive. May it do your work in our hearts. May your spirit move here. We pray in Jesus' name together. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Years ago, a young man was doing his research for his doctoral thesis, and during his study, he spent over a year with a group of Navajo Indians on a reservation in the Southwest. He lived with one particular family. He was right there in their, in their, their hut. He ate their food. He worked with them. And in general, he followed all the practices of being a Navajo Indian. The grandmother of the family spoke no English, yet... She developed a close relationship with this outsider who would come in to live as part of the Navajo. They seemed to share the common language of love, and they intuitively knew how to communicate with one another. And over the months, he learned a few phrases of Navajo, and she picked up some words and some phrases in the English language. When it was time for the young man to return to the university and write his thesis, the tribe held a going away celebration for him. It was marked with sadness because he had developed such a close relationship with all those who lived on the reservation. He was preparing to get in his pickup truck and drive away when the old grandmother came to him and she held his face in her hands and she looked intently at him and she was able to say these words, I like me best when I'm with you. I like me best when I'm with you. It is very sweet. And I thought about that phrase, and I think about our moms. There are times when we can say, hopefully most of us can say that, I like me best when I'm with you. I like me best because of you. I, I say this probably every year at Mother's Day. There's probably no such thing as a perfect mother, and yet all our mothers are perfect to us. They're, doing, they, they're still human. We know that we all make mistakes. We are all sinners. We're called to do duties. And mothers are called to a very high calling, a very high duty. And Hannah certainly was. We, we look at Hannah, and in her life, and, and even as I prayed, I hope you caught on to this, there are things that she did that are helpful to all of us. Man, woman, mother are not a mother. There are things that are helpful. And I want us to see four things that, that she was about and talk about them with us and call us to those very same things. The first is this. Hannah was a, a praying woman. Verse 10 tells us that in bitterness of soul, she prayed. And if you're like me, you ask, well, why is that? Well, if I hadn't jumped in at verse 10, we probably would have known. We get a little bit of the answer here in verse 6 and part of 7. And her rival... This is the rival to Hannah, used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Hannah had wanted to have a child, and she could not have a child. Her womb had been closed at that point. Now if you go back a little further in Scripture, her husband each year would take Hannah, he actually had another wife, and they would go to the temple to worship. And this other wife would humiliate Hannah because she had no children. 
And so Hannah was weeping bitterly over this. And I'm going to tell you, it was not a one-time occurrence. We read, I don't know if you caught on that, year by year, this was the occurrence that was going on. So there was a lot of hurt that had built up in Hannah's life. And she wept and, and she prayed bitterly. Verses 12 through 13 tell us that, that she kept on praying. She was praying in her heart. And we'll read this together now. She continued praying before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Now, Eli was, the, was there at the temple as one of the priests. And, and he saw her praying. Verse 13, Hannah was speaking in her heart. What that means, she was praying. Her lips were moving, but there was nothing coming out. Her voice was not heard. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. He looked at her and just thought that she was off a rocker, so to speak. Maybe not off a rocker, but at least messed up by drinking. And he says to her, when are you going to get your life together? When are, th- when are you going to start acting like a, a good girl should act? But she says to Eli, no, I'm not drunk. I am praying out of, the, out of my heart, just the feelings that are there. And she was doing exactly that. She was a woman. And in time, in time, God heard her prayer. God opened her womb, and she had a son. His name, Samuel, the book from which we read. And we're told in verse 20 of chapter 1, And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. So she names her son Samuel, saying, Because I have asked from the Lord for, from the Lord for him. Now, the Samuel, the name, sounds a lot like the Hebrew word that means heard of God. So she had prayed for a son. She was given a son, and when she named him, she named him heard of God. She had been heard from God and given a son. Now, her praying did not stop. We go into chapter 2, and I only read the first part of the first verse, and Hannah prayed. She continued to pray. Now, now backtrack. She had received the, the son that she had prayed for, and let me read something else to you. Verse 27. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Hannah prayed and celebrated God. She trusted God to answer that prayer. When she was given a son, she prayed and thanked God for his son. And then after giving up the son that she had longed for, she prayed. And look at her picture. We're, we're talking now just about this woman who prayed, but it is a picture of our mothers after the picture of our mothers today, they pray, they pour out their energies, they pray prayers of praise, they sometimes pray prayers of brokenness. Have you ever been there? I think we all have at times, especially our moms. Why do we pray prayers of brokenness? Because the very children that, that we love so deeply may have gotten somewhat off course. Maybe they're going, th- maybe they're not even off course, they're just struggling in life, and you can't, you know, we always say, I would do anything for my child. I would take upon myself what they're facing. And you pray that prayer, Lord, let me take it. But it is intended for them. And so you are confined at that time to pray for them and to bring them through by your model of closeness with God himself. And Hannah was doing that. She was a praying woman. Lots more here. Let's go to a second part about Hannah. She was a self-denying woman Hannah was was faithful to her promise. Again, in verses 10 and 11, she has promised to give any son that was given to her back to the Lord. Did you notice this? Let Let me read this to you. In verse 11, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Do you know that reference or what she's referring to? It is to the vow of being a Nazarite. And there are other Nazarites in Scripture. Samuel was presented or would be presented back to God as a Nazarite, one who would serve the Lord. Can you think of any others? Samson was one. John the Baptist was was a Nazarite. Any others? I'm sorry. Jesus? Okay. Jesus being a Nazarite. And 
I, I'm still thinking of one more that at least took Nazarite type vows. Paul at times took na- the vow of Nazarite at times. I don't know that he lived it totally, but we see it in Scripture. So I wanted to point that out to you. She was a self-denying woman. She prayed for the Lord to give her Samuel. He took, or she gave, them, gave him them back. Verses 27 and 28, she acknowledged, acknowledges the Lord and gives her son away. Is that not our job? All parents, is that not your job to acknowledge the Lord, thank Him for the children, but then to give them to the work of the Lord? But how do we, how do, we do that? I think James chapter 1 is a, is a good example of this. I believe that Hannah, I recognize New Testament, Old Testament, but this principle carries over both ways. I believe that Hannah was able to realize that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. She trusted God, knowing that He was the giver of these perfect gifts. He had given her the Son. And then we go into the second verse. Knowing that, she could say, for who sees anything different? Let's put, her, let's put me in there for a moment. She would be thinking, who sees anything different in me? What do I have that I did not receive? Meaning, in this case, her son. And if I then received it, why do I boast as if I did not receive it? She was acknowledging the work of God by self denial in her own life. You know, our mothers are often models of self-denial. Staying awake to comfort children. Staying awake so that when they're out and about, somebody knows when they come in. And I can say this in my household now, that's Suzanne. I can say from the time our first child was born, Jared, I think I was trying to be like just, just good. And, and when the baby cried, Suzanne was breastfeeding, Maybe one time I went and and I brought the baby to his mother. I brought Jared to his mother where he could be fed. But it was very soon that Suzanne said, you can't do this job anyway, so you might as well. One of us can get rest. And she's very good. But when the children are out, she is always awake to make sure they're home safely. My mom, was she had her place on the couch. You could not sneak in if you wanted to because she was making sure that watch was being kept, and mothers keep watch. Mothers give first aid to a scrape or a bruised knee. Mothers watch wash mud that is from the head to their toes off their children. I know we have pictures and we laugh about it now. All four children, literally, I don't know how they did this, but they are covered in mud, and they learn that day that when that happens, the first bath is outside in the hose. You don't get to come into the warm water. And Mama taught them that. Mothers spend hours at the ball field or at rehearsals for recital. They listen to troubles when they may have no one to listen to their own. I think that's very important. Sometimes sometimes our moms, it's like they they handle so much and nobody even listens to them. And I would tell you, I, I, I will speak of my mom again for a moment. My mother was the type that any kid... And young adults, she worked a lot with teenagers that were kind of down and out. They knew they had a friend in my mom. When she passed away, there's grown men there. They can't even, they they could barely come in. Some of them couldn't even come in for the funeral because they had been ministered to by my mom. But I watched my wife in the same way. Our children's grown friends now laying out their, their woes, their worries, their cares, and getting some good godly advice from my wife. But that's what mothers do. Mothers are self-deniers. Listen, listen to this poem. Grandma on a winter's day milked the cows and fed them hay, hitched the mule, drove kids to school, did a washing, mopped the floors, washed the windows and did some chores, cooked a dish of home-dried fruit, pressed her husband's Sunday suit, swept the parlor, made the bed, baked a dozen loaves of bread, split some firewood and lugged it in, Enough to fill the kitchen bin. Cleaned the lamps and put in oil. Stewed some apples before they spoiled. Churned the butter. Baked the cake and then exclaimed, For goodness sake! When the calves ran from the pen and chased them right back in again. Gathered eggs and locked the stable. Back to the house and set the table. 
cooked a supper that was delicious, then washed and dried all dirty dishes, fed the cat and sprinkled clothes, mended a basket full of hose, then opened the organ and began to play when you come to the end of a perfect day. They are self-deniers. Fred Craddock, in an address to, to preachers, caught the practical implications of sacrifice and particularly aiming at the sacrifice of our mothers. And he, and he said, to give my life for Christ, it appears glorious. To pour myself out for others, to pay the ultimate price of martyrdom. I'll do it. I'm ready. I'm ready, Lord, to go out in a blaze. And he adds, we think giving our all to the Lord is like taking a $1,000 bill and laying it on the table. Here I am. Here it is. Do with it as you please. But he continues to say, it's more, the reality of it is, is, especially for mothers, it's more like taking that $1,000 to the bank, you trade it in, and you get all quarters. And then you mothers go from place to place. A quarter here of service. 50 cents here of service. A quarter there of service. And you spend your life denying yourself, but ministering to one another and others, your children in particular, one quarter at a time. Mothers make deposits when they listen, listen to the neighbor's kids instead of saying, get lost. Mothers make deposits when they eat sandwiches at home and send a beautifully prepared meal to someone in need. Mothers make deposits when they give a cup of cold water to a shaky hand in a nursing home. Mothers are constantly making deposits one quarter at a time. And we thank you for that. A third thing we see in Hannah is that she was an industrious woman. If you look at verse 19, chapter 2 now, so you may have to turn the page, chapter 2, verse 19, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up to her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. We're, we're told here that, that she did something special for her son. Even though she had given him to the Lord, she continued to minister to Samuel. She brought him this, this little robe every year for him. We're not told a whole lot more. We don't know a whole lot more, but I believe that this act was characteristic of her life. Diana was one who invested in her family. Look now, verse 21. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters, and the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 21 tells us, depending on the translation, it will read, the Lord visited Hannah. Uh, the ES the NIV says, and the Lord was gracious to Hannah. How so? She had given Samuel back to the Lord, the son that she'd asked for, and then she was blessed, what, three more sons and two more daughters. She had quite a family to care for. The Lord was blessing her because of her faithfulness, and, and, and then he gave her these children. Now, children are a blessing, and it's wonderful for us to see. We, we read in verse 21, and the boy Samuel did what? He grew in the presence of the Lord. Now go to verse 26. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with men. Now where else do we see that comment in Scripture? Go to the book of Luke in our, in our Gospels and you see Luke commenting about Jesus that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with the Lord. So it was a good thing. There was a blessing here because of how Hannah was investing in her family. Part of what makes our children a blessing is, is when they, they go out and they can stand on their own. They can, they, they, yeah. and, and sometimes the blessing is in different ways, but we're so thankful when we look out and they're able to do that. David Jeremiah was talking about that in one of his sermons, and he, he told a story about two children that were becoming adults very quickly. And he said one day a little girl and her friend were playing house and they went over next door to their, their neighbor and they rang the doorbell, Lila. And this lady comes up and the little girl says, hello, we are Mr. and Mrs. Jones. May we come in for a visit? 
And so the older lady did not want to discourage them. She invited them in, and she said, have some cookies, have some lemonade. And after they had finished their lemonade, the lady offered to the children again, would you like some more lemonade? And the little girl looked at her neighbor, and she politely responded, no, thank you. We really must be going. Mr. Jones just wet his pants. <laughs> you know, maternal love lets go of children so that they can grow as God intends. Hannah did this by giving her son Samuel to the Lord. And, and again, verse 21 is an, an encouragement to us. The boy Samuel was growing up in the presence of the Lord. And in verse 26, he grew in favor with the Lord and also with men. I just have to believe that her other children were doing the same. They were growing in favor with the Lord and with men. Now, number four, Hannah was a thankful woman. We're all in chapter 10 now. And we began to look, the chapter opens up with, with her prayer or an opening up of her heart to, to, for everyone to see. She was thankful for the deliverance. Verse, verse 1, she was thankful for the deliverance that had come from the Lord. Hannah would never have to defend herself before her enemy. And I, I, I believe when Hannah speaks here, she's referring to the other woman. The other woman who was ridiculing her because she couldn't have children. But she didn't need to defend herself. Why? Because the Lord had come upon her giving her children, and he is the one that was making a statement and defending Hannah. Though she had been hungry, verse 5, she would hunger no more. Now, I want us to, to recognize something here as well. We are, we are told, and I pointed this out briefly in one way, Hannah was being ridiculed year after year after year, and maybe even more than that. But we're also told she kept up her worship. She kept going to the Lord. That never declined in her life. And, and we have to realize that we can't let others keep us from a solid and growing relationship with God. That's what Hannah modeled for us, and we need to grasp that same truth. Hannah was thankful that God is Lord. Look, verse 2 I just love. There is none holy, and I'll stop for a moment, just a reminder, there is none set apart like the Lord. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside, besides you. There is no rock like our God. Think about that one phrase. There is no rock like our God. There is nothing as solid as our God. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Nothing solid. Nothing as steadfast as our God. Nothing as immovable as our God. We move to verse 6 and we're told the Lord brings death and He brings life. He makes alive. It's a reminder. Who is in control, church? God is in control. We're told in verse 7, the Lord sends poverty and wealth. Church, who holds our finances? It is God. Verse 10, the Lord will judge. And I'm shortening these. There's more to it here. You can go back and read. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth in His time. In His time. Robert Ingersoll was a notorious skeptic. And when he was in his heyday, he would go and speak in this rundown Christianity and those who followed Christ. He went to a college one day and he gave a lecture. And as two of the students walked down the road after the lecture, one said to the other, well, I guess he knocked the props out from under Christianity, didn't he? And the other said, no, I don't think he did. Ingersoll did not explain my mother's life. And until he can explain my mother's life, I will stand by my mother's God. Amen. 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 Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, preacher, great preacher. He had four sons. They were all preachers. And someone once came into their home where, when all the family was there, and they thought that they could see what, what Howard, one of the sons, had to say, what he was made of. And so they asked Howard the question, Howard, who is the greatest preacher in your family? And Howard had a great admiration for his father. He looked across at his father, but he spoke immediately and he said, Mother, Mother is the greatest preacher. Moms, we, we, we show our appreciation this day and other days for you. 
We thank you for all you do, and we pray that God would richly bless you. Church, be like Hannah. There's so much there for us to model. Be like Hannah. And, and that, let that be your prayer. Let that be your commitment this day. We're going to stand and pray in just a moment. And as we do, you ask of the Lord, are there areas in my life that I need to be shaped as Hannah's was shaped? Let's stay now and pray. stand now and pray. Lord, we are grateful for your word. We pray that you come to a time of decision that you would bring conviction to our hearts where it is needed. Lord, we also pray that very lovingly we would feel your encouragement upon us this day. As, as, even as our, our video shared with us, there is a calling upon us that is unique to motherhood. And I pray for each of our mothers that they would rise to that calling, rise to that challenge. I spoke with one of our mothers as, before the church service started, and we were just commenting, children up first thing this morning, they're going, they go, and they go, and all day they go, and we run out of energy. And I pray that you would give our mother, sister, an outpouring of your strength for the task that they are called to day by day. Lord, may this be a day of blessing in their life as they spend time with their families. May they hear the words, Mom, we appreciate you. We love you. And Lord, now as we come to a time of invitation and commitment, may we ask of ourselves, is there some part of what we heard today that we need to change, we need to be better at. Perhaps we need to be better in prayer. Perhaps we need to deny ourselves more often and live for you. We're called to that by the Scripture. We know that. Lord, I pray that we would be encouragers of one another. I pray that we would be faithful to your word, thankful for the many blessings that come by your hand. And now, Lord, as we have the time of invitation, may your spirit move here. As you lead, may we respond, man or woman, boy or girl. May we not walk out this door or these doors without having done business with you. That is to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It may be a time of commitment to you, to join you in your work here in Trinity. It may be a commitment to you. Maybe you're calling one here to be a missionary or to be a preacher. Lord, as you call, may we respond. May we answer to your voice, not the voice of the preacher, but the voice of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Jeff is going to lead us in our hymn of invitation. And as we sing, won't you respond? The altar is open for prayer. Sam is already up front. I'll be down in just a moment. If you would like prayer, we would love to pray with you. You come as we sing, just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come. Just as I
you guys to be seated. Still remain in a spirit of prayer. We have people praying here. We, we also have had uh, a couple to unite with us. They've been visiting with us quite a while. And I'm get, we're going to make you take a break, and we'll have to finish that in a minute. So Jer- Jeremy and Chantel Shotlow, y'all come and stand, stand with me. Yeah, we're so excited. Both Jeremy and Chantel gave their hearts to the Lord when they were younger. They're, they've been, they followed Jesus Christ in baptism. They desire this day to unite with us upon their transfer of letter from a sister church. All those in favor of receiving them indicate by saying amen. Amen. And of course, there are no others. And why don't, Robert, why don't you come and stand with them? I think Robert, Robert I, I just like someone to stand with them. And we, we try to encourage one another this way. I want to ask each of you, when we stand back up and, and exit, come by and welcome Jeremy and Chantel. All right, I believe that's all we need to do except stand for prayer from Brother Mike. Mike's going to lead us in our closing prayer.